Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining the fifth webinar organized by AX Factors Project. AX Factors Project is a research project to improve prevention, early detection, and control of xylella fastidiosa through the establishment, uh, establishment of a multidisciplinary research program. Um, it is a four-year project founded by the European Union within the Horizon 2020 program. My name is Maximiliano Bianchi and I'm the um, communication manager of uh, this project. This fifth webinar is under the title of Latest, latest Updates on the di Diagnostic Tools for the Detection and Identification of Xylella Fastidiosa, Validations, Improvements and Performances of Different Procedures. And it will be jointly presented by Mrs. Francois Petit, EPPO, and uh, Juliana Loconsole, University of Bari and CNR. Uh, the webinar will provide uh, basic information on the European approach to the diag diagnostic with a specific fo focus on validation of tests. Criteria adopted for evaluating the performance of the different tests will be presented. Uh, the presentations will cover the main feature differentiating the currently available diagnostic approaches including an overview of the efforts made at the EU level for the preparation and harmonization of the current EPO diagnostic standard. Very short presentation of our two speakers uh, that I uh, want to thank for uh, being here. Uh, Francois Petit. Francois uh, studied agronomy in France and first worked for the French National Plant Protection Organization, NPPO. She began her, her career in, in 1986 as the manager of a regional quarantine division. In 1994, she joined the national level of the French NPPO as policy officer and stayed in this position up to, 2000, uh, in this position up to 2002. In this position, she has been in charge of coordinating of inspections at the national level. She has taken part in discussions on the plant health legislation at EU level, and she has been involved in international activities, bilateral and multilateral, for the French Ministry of Agriculture in 2003. She joined the European Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization as deputy director in this current position. She coordinates and implements diagnostic and pest risk analysis program for the organization, supported by a team of scientific officers and assist the director and assist uh, uh, the director general or more general matters. And then uh, Giuliana Loconsole of the University of Bari and CNR. Uh, she's a researcher, with 10, a researcher with 10 years of experience on invasive uh, plant pathogens of uh, woody, woody crops, gaining experience and contributing to develop novel knowledge about uh, biological, serological, and molecular characterization of olive and citrus pathogens. Development, development of innovative diagnostic approach, recombinant anti-SARA, multiplex real-time assays, and high-resolution melting analysis. She has been involved in research projects uh, focusing on the use of next-generation sequencing for the characterization of viral disease of unknown etiology and to explore the mechanism occurring in citrus plant infected by citrus tristeza virus under crux protection condition. She has uh, contributed in Pont in X in uh, AX factors uh, that to research uh, 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 Horizon 2020 uh, project to implement molecular diagnos diagnosis and uh, genotyping of Xylella fastidiosa. She has published more than uh, 15 peer-reviewed paper, papers. Uh, I want to, to thank you uh, for joining this uh, webinar in these very difficult times. The webinar will, um, will last about um, one hour, one hour and 15, and, and there, there will be a slot for answering your questions. Uh, um, by the way, you can write your questions, uh, your questions using the chat in the right corner of your, of your window. So we we'll collect them uh, at the end of the two presentations. 
um, uh, François and Juliana uh, will answer your uh, uh, questions and comments. Let's begin with the first presentation. Uh, François, thank you for being here. And you can uh, uh, share your screen so we can see your presentation. Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, first thing, uh, I hope you're all healthy and um, and that you're going through these difficult moments uh, as best as you can. So when we discuss this webinar with uh, Maria Saponari and Juliana, uh, they suggested that we could start it with a general presentation on the diagnostic program, as as explained in the summary. And uh, because the diagnostic protocol we are talking about today uh, is in fact uh, um, an EPO diagnostic protocol based on contribution of people, of course, but of experts, but um, it's published as an EPO diagnostic protocol. Uh, I'm going to give you some background uh, on EPO and uh, on our diagnostic program. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to um, uh, our mascot for the International Year of Plant Health. I'm afraid that a certain virus has, for the moment, um, uh, taken the precedence to our, our mascot and our International Year of Plant Health. But maybe we can get the best out of it by showing people um, that outbreaks uh, are important and that we also have outbreaks in uh, plant health. Um, so a little bit, uh, some words on EPO in one slide. So first, uh, what is important for the audience to know, and I know that there are people outside uh, the EPO region, so um, uh, I thought it was nice to start with uh, a, a general uh, information about EPO. So we work with national plant protection organization and plant health experts, and we count on them for the transfer at national level, of course. We have in EPO 52 member countries, and this includes all EU countries. We have two permanent observers, so the EU Commission and EU bodies, uh, and the Eurasian Economic Commission. And we work with panel of experts, uh, we are more than we have more than 200 national experts participating to the work of our panels, and this also includes the EU Commission and, uh, for example, in diagnostic, the EU reference laboratories. Beyond panel meetings, we also regularly organize workshops and conferences. Our main activities are about early warning best risk analysis in a complementary way to what EFSA does, the European Food Safety Authority. And we also develop standards on diagnostic inspection, contingency planning, eradication, containment. Um, we also have a, a, an important activity on information uh, in the way of uh, publishing data sheets. By the way, they are under revision. We've launched with the support of uh, uh, of the EU, a big program of revision of our data sheets. And we also have um, databases that provide distribution maps, pictures. Um, so I can only encourage you to go and visit. We also work on communication. And you can see on this slide a poster that has been done to educate people on the risk of bringing plants uh, when, when they travel. And of course, last but not least, we also have our hosting uh, the Eufresco uh, Network Secretariat, and um, we uh, we have an activity about research coordination. So that's uh, EPO in a in a glance. Um, we are often asked the question, what's the difference between EPO and the European Union? Uh, what are the links? Um, so all EU members are EPO members. And the one difference is that the EU prepares regulation and we make recommendation in the form of regional standards. And I'm going to come back to that when we are discussing more uh, the diagnostic activities. Uh, we have collaboration with EFSA and the EU reference laboratory, the newly established EU RLs. And uh, we, what our main objective is really to encourage synergies and avoid duplication of work because we basically depend on, a, on the same pool of experts. And that's quite important that we establish good 
collaboration. We also have collaboration with the Eurasian Economic Commission. This is more recent. As you can see, the agreement was signed in December 17, and we're gradually establishing collaboration plans with this commission as well. So we support plant health, as I said already, by early warning, horizon scanning, again, in a complementary way to what is done um, by EFSA. We are not exactly doing it in the same way, and we've realized that this two way of doing early warning can be very complementary. Uh, we evaluate pests to see if they can be regular if they should be recommended for regulation as quarantine pests so these are the known epo a1 and a2 list and then we prepare standards and in particular on diagnostics and information through global database um, that uh, is focused on the pests recommended for regulation or the pests that may present a risk to the region the EPO program on diagnostics started uh, in 1998, so that's not a new program, and it was started by my predecessors, um, David McNamara and Vlastajlov. Um, the idea was that to do their work, national plant protection organizations are conducting surveillance inspection at import, and to do that, you need laboratory analysis because you back up your inspection, your visual inspection by laboratory analysis. And of course, to do that, you need good guidance on how you can ensure correct detection and identification and how you can have harmonized methodology. So harmonization, helping our members, pulling the expertise is what was important in this program. So how do we do that? Uh, we have six panels. So we started initially with one panel, and now we, we have, uh, no, not one panel, I'm sorry. There was also a panel on bacterial diseases. So we started with two panels, and now we have six panels, one horizontal one and one and, and five, which are specialized per discipline. They are composed of specialists from EPO member countries, and uh, we meet, uh, the horizontal one meets uh, every year, but the other one meets meet every 18 months. Uh, we pro the, the main objective of these panels are to draft diagnostic protocols. And uh, you have here a picture of the panel on diagnostic and in bacteriology uh, during the, the meeting we had in Italy then during the good old time where we could travel. And uh, so in this meeting, we had we reviewed a number of diagnostic protocols and how are they prepared? They are prepared usually now by drafting teams and they follow a common format. Um, what is very important is that there is no need for the members of the drafting teams to be panel members. They can come, but they just need to be experts on the pest we are developing a diagnostic protocol on. What is also very important in our process is the revision. Once you've written a diagnostic protocol, you all know that technology is evolving, new tests are being developed. So we are really facing the challenge to update and maintain our protocol as updated as possible. And so we first have a, um, an, a review, a regular review of all the adopted protocols so that we can see if there is a need for revision. But we also can receive proposals from um, other people directly uh, via this email address, diagnostic at epo.int. So, um, what is important for you to remember is nothing is written in stone. So we revise and Juliana will, in, at the end of her presentation, show you some examples of that. So uh, uh, the example of uh, PM724, which is our diagnostic protocol for Xylella fastidiosa. So it was first approved in 2003. And at that time, what was important was Vitis and Citrus in 2003 no outbreak in the EPO region. We started the first revision in December 2015 at the panel on diagnostic in bacteriology. And to do that, we formed an expert working group of experts on uh, Xylella fastidiosa diagnostic from different countries. 
And we also received contribution from outside the APO region, from the US and Brazil. And since 2015, we basically have a nearly continuous work uh, on that protocol because we now have the fourth version and Juliana will tell you more about it. Just as an illustration, this is a working group uh, on, uh, on Xylella fastidiosa. So some of you will recognize themselves in, this, uh, in these pictures. So it's quite a big drafting team, um, I must say. This is quite unique, but this is quite um, an important uh, pest for the region. So in total, we have 126 pest specific protocols and eight general standards, which are all freely available um, in, on the EPO website, but also in our global database. And of course, also in the EPO bulletin when they are published, but they're always free access. Um, so uh, some words on the status of EPO diagnostic protocols. So as I told you at the start, we make recommendations in the form of regional standards. So our pest-specific diagnostic standards, they provide guidance to detect and positively identify a pest by one test or also combination of tests. And because we cover a big region, a big area, I told you 52 members, we go from Vladivostok to Scotland and then to the desert in Algeria to the top of Norway, so the Arctic Circle. So usually we include more than one method to take into account the capability of the laboratories and also the circumstances of use of the tests that are included in the diagnostic protocols. And it's very clear for us that one important point is the communication between laboratories, laboratory experts and risk managers when it comes to deciding what tests are most appropriate for your country or for your uh, what you want to do, if you are detecting the pest in an area where it's not present or if you're detecting a pest in an area while it's already present. This is what we call the circumstances of use. So basically, what I want you to remember is that in if even if an EPO protocol is recommending a number of tests, by the end of the day, the risk managers will make a decision. And it may happen that not all tests are selected at a country level because risk managers discussing with, with laboratory experts have decided so. So a little bit of terminology, um, we find in literature a number of terms, assay, method, test, protocol, diagnostic protocol. And the first thing we had to do in EPO to understand each other was to agree on a terminology. It's never perfect to agree on a terminology. You will always have someone saying, oh, I prefer this other test. But when you're trying to harmonize, you have to go through that step. So in EPO, we prefer to use test in the EPO standards, which is the equivalent of assay and equivalent of protocol in the way people use it. A test in the EPO language is a combination of a method, a target, and a matrix. So example here, which is not very relevant for diagnostic for a, for for a Xylella, but you have, for example, real-time PCR. Uh, one virus that is occupying my days at the moment, somato brown rigose root virus, and for example, seeds. And an EPO diagnostic protocol is usually provi providing combinations of tests. So that's what you have to remember when I say a test, this is what it means. And when I say an EPO diagnostic protocol, it means usually more than one test. What is quite important in our region and has been important since more than 10 years now is quality assurance and accreditation work program. Uh, laboratory in the EPO region are usually accredited according to the ISO standard 17 or 20, 25. And for some of our member countries, it's even a legislative requirements. 
So we were very early on faced with this issue of harmonization of interpretation of that standard for plant pest diagnostic laboratories. You may, you all know, I'm sure that this standard was mainly developed at the start for um, the um, um, chemical labs. And of course, constraints we have in plant pest are different than people working with chemicals. So ISO uh, standard accreditation bodies were used to accredit chemical labs, but they struggled a little bit. And this ended up with some divergence of interpretation. And this was the reason why experts in plant health diagnostic ask us, please, can we develop our own interpretation, our interpretation of what the requirements of 17 or 25 mean for plant pest diagnostics? And this is what we started. We first started with a basic standard on quality assurance and what it means in plant health that was in 2007. And then in 2009, we really developed one of our key standards now the standard on the interpretation of ISO 17025 for plant pest diagnostic. And this one includes guidance on how to validate tests. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. This standard, as you can see, is a living one. We had a first revision in 14, another one in 18, another one in 2019. And we are preparing another revision right now. So what does it mean what what is why do we need validation why is it important to have validated tests in our region a laboratory preparing for accreditation should only use validated tests and the validation of a test is done by evaluating the performance characteristics so we have identified key performance criteria that should be evaluated for a test to be considered validated. This is analytical sensitivity, how much, analytical specificity, what, reproducibility, repeatability, and also selectivity. And I will tell you more about that. Uh, validated tests are tests that provide uh, performance um, values for performance criteria, and they are considered as standard tests or standard method. Again, the terminology varies in the field, but also across fields. So in ISO, you have a slightly different terminology. So this is an example of what you can find in the standard, and I will tell you more, a little bit more about this. So the first um, criteria is analytical sensitivity. So it's defined as the smallest amount of a target that can be detected reliably, so the limit of detection. And so you give you you provide and, and in the definition it's stated that you can get more guidance in uh, our what we call accreditation standard. We often call PM798 our accreditation standard. So the example that is given here is about molecular methods. And it tells you how to evaluate analytical sensitivity. It tells you that you should perform at least three experiments with spiked samples with a, a certain range of cells of the target per mL. That you should do it by making decimal diluted cell suspension in the sample extract and that you determine then the lower cell density giving a positive test result. And of course, if you don't obtain consistent results, then you should do additional experiments. Specificity. So specificity, analytical specificity is composed of inclusivity and exclusivity. Inclusivity is I'm trying to demonstrate that my test will react the same if I use a range of my targets. So the performance of a test with a range of target organisms covering genetic diversity, different geographical origin, and hosts. The exclusivity is here to show you that you, are, you do not have a cross-reaction with non-targets. And so again, 
in our accreditation standard guidance is given on how to evaluate these performance criteria. So analyze a range of strains, uh, analyze a set of known targets, and you are given detailed guidance on how to do this. So I can only recommend you to go in and look at, at this accreditation standard for the detailed guidance. And what is given on molecular method is also given on ELISA, on IF, etc. So the repeatability will be the level of agreement between replicates of a sample tested under the same condition. So again, you are asked to do a number of replicates and then to see if you obtain consistent results. And the reproducibility is, is when you will vary time, person, equipment, location. That's not always easy to do, but you are, for example, varying the time uh, during, you, you do it at different days, you are trying to, to make the experiment with different people in your lab. So that's, that's what reproducibility is about. And then selectivity is to look at how your matrix can affect the test performance. So again, the specific guidance is given in, in the standard. Um, there are other performance criteria that are not uh, uh, oblig considered as obligatory, but are providing good information. This is a diagnostic sensitivity and the diagnostic specificity. So in fact, you're comparing tests or you're comparing your test with um, samples of known status. And this is this, and this is why it's important to distinguish what is analytical and what is diagnostic sensitivity or specificity. So why is all this important? Why does it matter? Well, in fact, when a lab is performing a test, if the test has already validation data, so if performance characteristics are available, the laboratory will verify that it can perform the test according to the performance characteristics that are given. And that's, that's much less work than performing the full validation. So this is why it's very important to have as much validation data as possible. So just a few words on the major revision we did. We had a first major revision of PM798 in 2008 to include the flexible scope of accreditation and a risk analysis concept. So do I always need to validate all the perform to do I always need to evaluate all the performance criteria? This depends of on what I want to do. Um, uh, if I'm looking at a test for confirming an, um, an a, a culture, for example, a bacteria culture, um, the analytical sensitivity is not that important. What I need is a good analytical specificity. So this is the type of anal 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 analysis you do uh, when you start validation. Do I need to do everything? The second major revision was in 2019 because we have now a new version of ISO 17025, which will come into force at the end of this year uh, if, if it's maintained, but that's, that's, uh, that was a requirement before the COVID crisis. And um, all, all this new version is more risk-based. So we had to adapt our standard to this new approach and also include more information about impartiality, confidentiality, and non-confirming work. And we are giving very specific examples on how to manage the risk at uh, operational and strategic level. We're giving um, guidance on that. Uh, we had a training planned in spring on that new version, but unfortunately it has it had been postponed due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, another standard which is important and has been used in uh, X-Factors, but also many other projects on uh, plant pest diagnostic is the guidelines on the organization of interlaboratory comparison. We adopted this standard in 2014. And at the moment, there is another project, another EU-funded project going on 
on validation and we will use the outcome of that project to see if our standard needs to be amended, improved, etc. So um, in 2004, we were just like, OK, we have the diagnostic protocol. We have guidance on validation. Can we do a little bit more to help our countries? And then with our members, with our experts, we, we thought, well, maybe we could build a database where experts will be able to say, I'm an expert on this. And then they could, um, they could help co colleagues if you know where to find expertise. And in 2011, uh, we thought that it would be really valuable to be able to share validation data through that database. So this is the existing database uh, that uh, it exists since 2007. So for collaboration and communication between laboratories, I have to be uh, to be very clear that this is a database of laboratories which are part of the NPPO diagnostic network. So we only the labs that are recognized as being part of the NPPO diagnostic network can be in this database. And in this database, you can find validation data on Zilela. So you can see that many partners of um, X factors have provided validation data through that database. So this is an example of, on Xilela. And these validation reports are generated by the laboratory, but also in the framework of projects. So validation data generated in the framework of X factors is available in the database. And I'm very pleased to tell you if you are that if you are a little bit patient, uh, you can have uh, from the 1st of May a new much more um, user-friendly version of the database uh, because we have improved the database in the framework of uh, EU-funded project Valitest. So that's about um, my the first very general part of the of the presentation as an introduction to Juliana, which who will go much more into Xilela, which you're all waiting for. Um, all our recommendations are available in Global Database. And what I have to insist on is that EPO cannot do anything if we don't have the collaboration of experts from our region and sometimes also from other parts of the world. So, so I really thank you for your attention of this first part of the webinar. Again, take care and stay healthy. Okay. Uh, good morning uh, uh, to to everybody. Um, thank you to Francois to to give a detailed um, uh, view on the standards on uh, diagnostics. My presentation is uh, focalized on uh, the implementation of uh, pr protocols reported by EPPO for uh, the detection of Lella fastidiosa. Um, before 2013, um, EPPO published only one version of, um, of protocol for diagnosis of, diagnosis of Xylella fastidiosa in 2004. And uh, um, as shown in the slides, um, uh, these, uh, um, uh, the protocols were composed by C only six pages. After 2013, um, the first revision was uh, was carried out in 2016, and uh, as you can see, um, EPO protocols were composed by 12 pages. But uh, after this first revision, two major revisions followed in 2018 and 2019. And um, as you can see, um, the pages of uh, the uh, protocols of diagnostic were increased to 50. So uh, before two 2013, uh, the pages were six. Now we have um, a standard on Xalella fastidiosa of 20 page, uh, 50 pages. Why uh, this implementation after 2013? Uh, before this date, uh, the bacterium was, was mainly confined in the, um, in the Americas and Taiwan. And uh, the EPO protocol um, uh, were based 
on study on citrus, on infection of Salella fastidiosa in citrus and grapevine. Uh, only few interceptions were found before 2013 in Europe. Uh, Xylella fastidiosa, only um, infection of Xylella fastidiosa in coffee plants imported by third country. After 2013, the situation in Europe um, changed uh, because epidemics were found uh, in Italy where the bacterium is associated to a severe disease which causes desiccation in olive. Also, epidemics were found in France and Spain. Uh, thus, um, the, the need to, the need to um, make available uh, a, um, a protocol for an efficient detection Xylella fastidiosa um, um, pushed to, um, to revise, um, uh, pushed the, the revision of the EU protocol. Um, uh, in this slide, I reported the EPO protocols um, uh, in the first version of uh, the diagnostic on Xylella fastidiosa. As you can see, um, uh, isolation, pathogenicity test, serological test, and only conventional PCR were reported. Um, in addition, both isolation and screening tests uh, were, um, were performed to confirm the presence of Xylella fastidiosa. But um, the bacterium is a complex pest uh, and the detection um, uh, has a critical uh, issues. Uh, the bacterium um, uh, is present in different um, uh, subspecies. There are different subspecies of the bacterium. It is transmitted by vectors and it is also by more than 500 plants um, with uh, this pro causing disease in uh, uh, important uh, crops like olive, uh, grapevine, citrus, and prunus species, in uh, ornamental plants like polygala myrtifolia, oleander, lavender, and coffee. And um, in other case, uh, it is uh, it, uh, it causes symptomatic infection. Um, this is a critical, uh, these are critical issue to validate test because uh, um, we need uh, um, well, to detect efficiently uh, the bacteria, we need uh, of protocols that should be validated on different matrices considering all these critical issues. Uh, as uh, Francois said to you, the revision of the protocol EPO started in 2015 by a group of experts uh, from different country or different EU country from USA and Brazil. And the, the, the work started in 2015, but now um, is, uh, is evolving. Uh, also, uh, for the, the, rev the revision of the, um, of the protocols reported by EPO were supported uh, by different projects. Two H20 uh, founded uh, projects, um, X Factors and Ponte, and a Fresco project and some national projects, which contributed to, uh, co to, um, to collect the validation data that, uh, were be included, uh, that were included in the EPO protocol. This is the main organization of uh, the last version of, uh, um, of the standards of diagnostic of, of Salella fastidiosa. And uh, in um, at the main changes uh, for the detection, the section of the detection, and the section of identification and subspecies determination. Also, um, in this last version, there are uh, 18 appendix where uh, are reported uh, all the conditions to perform the tests. Uh, so the, um, the reagent, the condition, uh, the reaction condition, uh, and the performance characteristics of each test and the validation data collected for each test. So as you can see uh, in the last version, uh, there are different uh, for, uh, format of uh, real-time PCR, uh, new rapid screen like LAMP, RPA, and direct tissue blood immune assay, and um, <clears throat> some uh, updated about serological assay. 
about uh, symptoms more pictures uh, were added uh, like uh, lip scorch symptoms on almond on polygola myrtifolia on uh, olives desiccation of law on olive and uh, uh, more details uh, were are provided on sample preparation which is a critical issue to detect cor to correctly detect the bacterium in this table is reported the number of leaves or, or or shoots that should be used and the weight of the samples when a laboratory uh, need needs to test individual plants so if you um, if the samples um, uh, refers to symptomatic plants, should consist of branches or cuttings representative of the symptoms, and uh, com and contains and should be contained 10 to 25 uh, leaves. If uh, the laboratory is processing asymptomatic plants, the sample should be representative of the entire aerial part of the plants. And uh, the weight of the laboratory sample should be uh, about 0.51 gram. If uh, the, the sample consists of uh, dormant plants, uh, xylene tissue should, should be used. Uh, just uh, an example, uh, for olive, uh, um, if you uh, need to sample, to, if, you, if you need to sample, uh, to sample symptomatic things, you need to take um, at least 8 to 10 olive shoots uh, close to the desiccated uh, branch. But if you are, um, but if you need to sample an asymptomatic tree, you need to take uh, olive shoot uh, randomly from the canopy of the plants in the medium upper part. In the last version of the EPO protocols also uh, was, uh, was included this table, uh, which is a guidance on uh, sampling uh, for lots of plants from, um, for some species. Um, uh, some species uh, are considered um, uh, high susceptible species. So uh, their movement in new uh, territory is, a is, um, is, is submitted to restriction by uh, EU decisions. Uh, so to test, uh, this is a guidance to, te uh, this is a guidance, uh, to uh, test samples uh, composed by a large amount of tissue. Um, uh, because sometimes at the consignments and uh, in place of production, um, uh, the number of plants uh, that need to be tested are very high. Uh, in this table, it is, are indicated the minimum of leaves or shoot that should be collected per plants, the number of plants that can be pulled, the type of tissue to be recovered, and the, the maximum weight of the uh, composite samples. Uh, to, um, uh, to detect, to confirm the presence of Xylella fastidiosa, uh, different uh, screening texts are reported reported um, in the EPO protocol, a serological and molecular test. When two tests are performed, they should be based on different biological principles or targeting different parts of the genome. If uh, uh, the bacterium is not detected, the test is negative. If uh, inconsistent results are obtained, uh, we need to retest again uh, the sample. Uh, if at least two tests are positive, Xylella fastidiosa is directed. I like uh, other protocols for uh, bacteria. The isolation for Xylella fastidiosa is not uh, uh, required uh, as a um, um, screening test. It's not recommended as screening test. Uh, a molecular test generally should be performed for the detection of symptomatic plant from a pest-free area. And the uh, serological test could be used. It could be used in a known outbreak area, uh, for example, in the containment area. Oops. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Um, about the screening text on vectors, the test should be performed on heads, single or pooled heads. 
Experience in Italy uh, showed that uh, up to five insects can be pulled to perform one test. Experiment conducted in uh, France showed that up to five heads of Spilenus pumarius can be pulled. Um, the screening tests are um, based on the molecular test, at least two tests uh, targeting the different parts of the genome. In these slides, um, uh, these slides show the, uh, shows the tissue selected um, to prepare a sample. Uh, generally, they uh, should be uh, sh uh, the the sample sh um, uh, should be consist of leaves showing lip scorching and symptomless leaves, uh, especially patches, mild veins excised from uh, the leaves, and piece of shoot. Uh, to detect the bacteria in, per in perennial plants um, uh, by some um, star, based on some study, um, uh, uh, the bacterial detectability resulted better in the shoots than in the leaves. So uh, we generally use this type of sample, in this, this case is for olive, we use some piece of shoots and uh, um, patches, so a, comp a mixed samples. For a child, for example, uh, the, bacterial uh, the bacterium is detected all year round in xylem tissue scraped from cuttings uh, and in, in patches of leaves only from May to June. Depend, uh, it depend, uh, depends on the seasonal temperatures. Uh, after the preparation of the samples, uh, the samples need to be homogenized. Uh, 0.5 gram of tissues are generally homogenized to have a, uh, a sap representative of the entire samples. Um, an accurate uh, and early detection xylella fastidiosa for an accurate and early detection uh, um, uh, of xylella fastidiosa uh, there are some challenges the isolation is an important test but it's very difficult to isolate the bacteria so this protocol this test is not uh, suitable for the routine rapid and sensitive detection of the bacterium uh, serological say as uh, ELISA and direct tissue blot immunisay are uh, screening tests for some host species and uh, um, the diagnostic sensitivity of the ELISA is uh, similar to the conventional PCR. About the molecular test, the QPCR says uh, um, produce, uh, produce the best performance values. Uh, while for conventional PCR, based on use of RST primer, um, uh, sometimes a false negative for inhibition could be uh, obtained. Uh, the New, uh, the new um, rapid screening lamp and RPA um, have the advantage to work directly on crude sap, but uh, uh, when applied to uh, a large number of samples, especially lamps, especially the lamp essay, uh, can give, can, can give um, uh, contamination. EPO protocols uh, um, uh, reported, uh, report um, two different uh, serological uh, kits to detect the bacterium uh, by ELISA, the kit uh, by Agritest and LEV. And the analytical sensitivity of the ELISA test uh, was assessed uh, um, in, uh, in the range of 10 to 5, 10 to 4 CFU per milliliters, which is similar to the analytical sensitivity of the conventional conventional PCR based on RCT primers. The critical steps for the molecular test is the extraction and the purification of the DNA templates. In the APO protocol, um, four um, extraction procedures are recommended. The, um, uh, the CETA-based extraction, which uses chloroform uh, to extract DNA from plants and the insect and some commercial kits that could be automatized on the, some uh, platform for the extraction. The quick pick of provided by uh, the Bionobile, which um, um, 
which uh, include a first, uh, a first step of uh, concentration of bacterial cell. Uh, the Dinesi plant mini kit and American food kit uh, provided by, key, by Kiagen. The first uh, is used to re uh, recover, uh, the, the first recovers four small amount of tissues uh, from plants. And uh, the American food kit is based on chloroform and, uh, uh, and the use of CTAB as silicon column to capture the DNA. Uh, the quick pick is used also for, to extract the DNA from plants and insects. Uh, the CETA based extraction uh, have uh, some advantages and dis uh, uh, disadvantages. Uh, the extracts uh, can be of good quality for some uh, matrices. The protocol is cheapest, but uh, um, sometimes plant inhibitors can affect the, the uh, following reaction. The extracts are of poor quality for some matrices and cannot be automatically and it is based on use of chloroform. Um, about the test reported uh, of qPCR reported in Epor, um, the analytical sensitivity assessed for this test is uh, close to 10 to 2 CFU per milliliters. Uh, all these tests are based on uh, um, diagnostic primers and probe um, previously identified as uh, uh, reagents to be suitable for the detection of Xylella fastidiosa. Um, this test uh, showed the high robustness in um, the previous uh, uh, test performance study a proficiency test uh, carry on, carried on in the, in, the, um, uh, in the last two years. And the QPCR of Harper and Francis provided the best performance values uh, in the range of 98 to 100% uh, in, um, TP, in a TPS organized in 2018. Um, in the table, I report the target gene um, for uh, the different tests of qPCR. So the, uh, the critical step remains destruction and purification because some uh, plants uh, are difficult matrices. Uh, in the next slides, there is an example, a practical example, of difficult plant matrices, um, like the uh, uh, lavender plants. If uh, the, the same plants of lavander uh, with CTABs um, uh, extracted, um, so submitted to extraction by CTAB, uh, resulted positive to Xylella fastidiosa by QPCR and LAMP, but negative in conventional, by conventional PCR um, based on a RCT primer. The same plants extracted by American Food Kit resulted positive um, by conventional PCR. Also, uh, EPO um, protocols uh, provide the interpretation of results for the qPCR. If uh, uh, the positive amplification control uh, produced uh, produce amplification curves, um, the, react, the, the reaction was performed good, and this curve should be exponential. Um, the, uh, if the negative amplification control should, uh, um, uh, doesn't, give, uh, ampli doesn't uh, give amplification curve, the reaction was performed good because there is no um, contamination. The samples is negative if a sample uh, if, a, if a sample doesn't produce an amplification curve, but a, a sample is positive if a uh, amplification curve is produced. If any contradictory and clear results are obtained, tests should be repeated. 
all the performance, most of the performance criteria and the validation data reported uh, in the EPO protocols uh, were retrieved by uh, harmonization validation of the diagnostic procedure uh, carry, uh, performed in uh, provinces test orga and test performance study on plants and vectors organized at the uh, European level, which uh, uh, involved uh, many laboratories um, below belonging to EU um, uh, country and non-EU country. And uh, the protocols uh, evaluated were some uh, DNA extraction procedure and five different formats of uh, qPCR. Now, some new scientific advances introduced in the, um, in the last uh, revision of EPO protocol. A um, DNA extraction procedure to test samples in pools, a triplex format of qPCR, the direct tissue blood immune assay, RPA, and LAMP uh, used as a rapid screening test. Uh, as uh, I showed uh, before uh, in the, um, the previous slides, um, uh, we, um, uh, um, samples can be, um, uh, 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 plants can be uh, sampled in composite samples, in pools. Uh, but in this case, uh, a, large amount, a large amount of tissues should be processed. So in the EPO protocol, there is a process to, um, concentrate, to, to concentrate the bacterial cell, starting from a large amount of tissues in big extraction, in big extraction bags. Uh, the samples are grinding, um, are homogenized in these big extraction bags then uh, submitted to a high speed centrifugation the cell of the bacterium are um, uh, are centrifugated in a pellet a conventional test are uh, um, performed on this type of pellet using the the, uh, the buffer um, uh, of each uh, reported for each test uh, these slides show the results uh, obtained uh, uh, for uh, the um, simulation of complex samples. So in the table are reported the, the number of infected portions used or number of xylella free portion and the pool, the gram in uh, the weight of the pools uh, and the, the number of plants so that can be uh, pooled for olive, oleander, polygala, lavender, cherry, so for woody plants and for herbaceous uh, plants. Uh, the best value of diagnostic sensitivity were obtained by qPCR for all species. ELISA and LAB performed well on woody plants except for cherry and herbaceous plants because failed the detection in the composite samples of obtained for or from cherry and batches plants. Um, a new format uh, of uh, qPCR, a triplex qPCR uh, published in 2019 by Bonans, um, was included in the last version of uh, EPO protocol and it is uh, in the and it, it could be used for a broad spectrum detection. Uh, this uh, format of qPCR target to uh, genomic region of the bacterium reported in the uh, um, previous uh, paper of uh, Harper et al. 2010 and uh, Young et al. 2013. Also, um, uh, the, um, um, this, the test um, uh, target um, an artificial construct, G block, which can be added to the SAP and function as a, a positive internal control or internal control. Um, this format of PCR uh, showed uh, to have a similar sensitivity of uh, uh, the hard the qPCR reported by Harper. Uh, um, the addition of uh, um, the, the um, oyang tacman PCR is uh, an extra confirmation for the presence of Xylella fastidiosa and the introduction of the internal control uh, in the triplex in, in uh, Tacman is uh, a um, extra control to check if F uh, inhibitors uh, um, uh, to, to check the, um, the effects of inhibitors uh, of the plant material on the 2QPCR. 
about uh, the rapid uh, the rapid test to screen a lot um, a, a, a large number of samples um, the direct tissue blot immunosay uh, is a very rapid and simple, uh, simple test because it consists uh, of uh, um, um, it consists of prints on the uh, membrane of section of uh, uh, twigs and it was uh, first validated on olive uh, twigs um, the membrane could be observed under a lower power magnification lens after the development uh, but interpretation could be a limiting factor because uh, uh, sometimes many samples are dubbed so the test should need to be implemented and in the next slides uh, the implementation is ongoing in the project X factors. Uh, about the rapid molecular test in the EPO, bar, uh, EPO protocol, um, I reported two isothermal amplification. The recombinant polymerase amplification based on the use of the Agjac Agda kit, uh, which uh, show an analytical sensitivity of 10 to 5, 10 to 4 uh, CFU per milliliters um, if we use the device. If the samples, the amplification reaction is loaded on the chamber, on the detection chamber, uh, the sensitivity is higher. Um, the second isothermal uh, amplification is the lamp in the EPO um, um, diagnostic on Xalella fastidiosa report a different test in the slides uh, um, is uh, the the, the, um, uh, the kit of Ambiotec is showed and it was validated on olive, uh, polygala myrtifolia, and oleander. However, uh, we need to be careful because uh, lamp contamination is, uh, is uh, are very common and also specific reaction. Uh, the, um, the advantage of this kit that is represent uh, is um, is the fact that uh, this type of test could use it directly in field so for in situ detection of the bacterium uh, as I said before, in the framework of XF actor, some patterns are implemented. Um, uh, the uh, rapid test of uh, as uh, the direct tissue blood immune say uh, in the, uh, this um, in Brazil, uh, the direct tissue blood immune say was validated on citrus with good uh, results and good signals of a positive reaction. Um, in uh, Italy, CIM, uh, the institution of CIM of Bari, is um, uh, implementing uh, the direct tissue blood immune assay and the real time lamp assay um, uh, to test olive trees uh, uh, in absence of symptoms. And the partner of Ambiotech, uh, the partner Ambiotech, is producing uh, two prototypes. One, one is a device, new device for direct tissue blood immune assay to acquire an automatically elaborate images of membranes. And the second prototype is a real-time lamp device for, uh, for to test uh, simultaneously 48 samples. So the test uh, could be um, uh, very, uh, very rapid. Uh, regarding the submission determination, uh, EPO recommended the MLST analysis, which is based on the amplification of seven of skipping genes uh, from pure culture or uh, DNA extracted from plants. However, in the last revision, um, to assign the subspecies is enough to sequence uh, two different combinations, uh, one um, only two genes in different combinations. Combination, Cis G and Malef, and RPOD and Malef. But if uh, um um, uh, when the new findings or new host speeches are uh, found, uh, you need to know the sequence type. Uh, in this case, you need to perform the PCR on the seven of skipping genes. New um, perspective now for to implement in the future the diagnosis of Xalella fastidiosa. Um, so um, 
um, we need to implement uh, sure um, of the, the sampling methods, the sampling methods in symptomatic and symptomatic plants materials, both in field and uh, consignments. We need to implement uh, the in situ detection of Xylella fastidiosa directly in feed without moving infected material from infected area and Xylella free area. Um, also, um, we need to implement the procedures for the highly sensitive detection in host plants and vectors. In uh, recently, new papers, new study were published. Um, in the slides are showed a new tetraplex QPCR assays uh, to detect identif Xylella fastidiosa identifi uh, identification of different species of sub uh, implant tissues. And uh, um, validation real time PCR assay uh, for the specific detection of each uh, uh, Xylella fastidiosa subspecies. Both these papers uh, are based um, on the comparative genomics approach to uh, identify uh, conserved region and uh, to uh, um, select, design a new set of primers. Um, another um, uh, and the other two papers uh, showed in the slides are based on NGS analysis and uh, droplet digital PCR. Until now, these two techniques uh, were used only with the research purpose, but uh, they, can be, they can be used um, to, um, uh, to solve, to, to explain the, uh, some uh, adaptable situation. Um, in the paper of Bernans et al. 2019, NGS analysis uh, is used to improve the detection of Xylella fastidiosa and the subspecies identification. Um, and uh, in the paper uh, of Dupai et al. 2019, the, PC, the droplet digital PCR is used to detect the Xylella fastidiosa. Um, test performance study uh, should be done. One is ongoing. It, it was announced, uh, the registration were closed, but due to the emergence of COVID-19, um, uh, the, the deadlines of the shipment of the samples uh, are, um, uh, were, um, were extended. Um, and uh, this, TP, uh, this, uh, this, this, this test performance study uh, should be performed on um, to evaluate a new DNA extraction procedure from plants and insects and it is based on magnetic beads. It is a kit of pro provided by Promega, the Maxwell Pure Food uh, GMA, uh, GMAO and authentication kit which is um, which uh, could be automatized on the platform provided by Promega, uh, it, uh, don't, it doesn't use chloroform and uh, it was standardized and validated by CNR and uh, it is uh, used in several laboratories in Italy and Spain. Also, uh, a TPS on composite samples should be uh, done in the, um, in the next uh, months. In um, um, conclusion, and I want to underline that uh, the, the, the revision of the protocols is uh, constantly evolving because uh, new study, new, uh, new diagnostic methods are uh, published. And uh, when, these, um, when a new protocol are, uh, is published, we need to, uh, to obtain validation data on uh, uh, different matrices um, uh, to, to be sure that the protocol is efficient to detect the bacterium uh, in, the, um, in, the main, uh, in the mainly in the main matrices uh, that Xylella fastidiosa uh, infected. I finished my presentation. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. The, the, the real-time PCR, so it's a question from Montserrat. Uh, good morning, Montserrat. So um, we, uh, you have validation, uh, you have information. It's the Li et al. 2013 
was evaluated and you have uh, in the diagnostic protocol a link to a test performance study that was performed between 17 and 18 um, that provides where, where this test was included. So, uh, so if you go in the diagnostic protocol in the appendix eight, where the test is described, you have a link to the the, the report uh, where the evaluation uh, was done. Does it does this answer your question, Monserrat? Monserrat, now we say we see we check if he answer in the chat. Uh, Juliana, a question for you in the chat now by Daniele De Leo. G can you read it, uh, Juliana? Do you want to read uh, the uh, or, or Francois as you want? Uh, in the, chat, um, the question I can read it. Is there a way to understand if the DNA extraction is of good quality for a specific matrix, for example, lavender, which is difficult to extract? I mean, is there a recommended protocol to test the extracted DNA quality? How? Mm, as uh, I show yeah, in my presentation, I was, uh, there, is, there was an, an example on la lavender plants. And uh, generally, in our lab, we use uh, for the lavender, no the CTAB uh, extraction, but uh, the Medicon uh, or uh, a new, this new procedure, uh, the Maxwell uh, kit of Promega. Uh, because uh, with CTAB uh, you can have you can precipitate inhibitors that affects uh, the following reaction. Um, th there was a first question from another question from Montserrat, so which was about uh, the ELISA yes. Leve and the real time PCR uh, from Harper. And uh, and so Monsera is is ex is explaining that she's got about forty percent of false positive with ELISA tests with wild uh, species as asparagus and false negatives uh, approximately thirty seven percent and uh, if the CTs were above thirty two so uh, yes. she says we we should say something about it. Yeah. Yes, it is uh, um, and, um, as reported in the Apple protocol. I also first uh, probably I don't uh, I didn't say, but in the presentation uh, it is reported that Eliza performed good on some matrices, not all the matrices infected by Xylella fastidiosa. Um, it works well on olive, uh, polygala myrtifolia, but on uh, some uh, on wild species, which are difficult to matrices, ELISA is uh, not suggested, is not recommended. Um, and uh, uh, these matrices are difficult also to be tested uh, with molecular uh, with molecular test also because the CQ value obtained are, uh, are high. Um, uh, but uh, the problem is uh, to select the best uh, tissue tissues of uh, each um, of each wild species repeat the test more times and uh, i uh, read another question uh, from uh, monsara uh, monserrat uh, perez uh, we tested qpcr lee in 2013 it was uh, evaluated in a test performance study um, conducted in 2018 uh, or uh, 18 or, or 16 i don't remember exactly the date and uh, um, it uh, doesn't uh, perform well like uh, QPCR of Harper, and um, the, the, the extracts were obtained by using uh, uh, Mericon DNA extraction procedure. There are other questions because now I'm reading the, the email that uh, uh, Maximiliano sent to me. I don't know if in the chat there are other questions. Yeah, there is a question about the, but that's about the legislation. So I think it's um, it's more it's it's tricky yes. to answer. Yes. Yes. She asked why is Ouyang PCR in the new draft of the decision and not Lee's? 
in our experience, don't you think, in your experience, don't you think Lee sensitivity is a little bit better than Ouyang? Um, uh, I mean, we would have to go to the test performance studies to answer the second part of the question, not the first one. A last question, another question from Hamed Kano. My question, please, why did you not use tech electronic nose to detect volatile compounds like ethylene at first before entering isolation nucleic acid? Yes, I read that. Uh, yes, uh, um, uh, I, I say that uh, the study the, is evolving, uh, the, the, the publication of new proton additional data, uh, we need to collect this data. I know that some uh, um, institution works uh, on this type of uh, detection, but uh, at the moment uh, uh, there are no validation it's, data yeah. Yeah. validation data to be included this technique in the EPO protocol. Exactly. I think it's uh, it's still at research level and uh, and and um, in general. Um, Getting validation data on electronic nodes um, and getting the proper volatile content um, and also depending on the matrix, uh, which is a complication for uh, Xylella. Um, wow, we are not there. Um, I okay. I uh, I found the the question of um, of Esther. Uh, why is a young PCR introduced in the new draft of the decision and not uh, LIS? Um, we don't uh, we don't use in our laboratories this uh, this protocol. Uh, but I think if uh, it was included, uh, it was supported by validation data. Um, probably uh, the problem is uh, the map. Can, could be the matrices uh, um, submitted to the, to the validation. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, what, what, what is the performance of this test, because as uh, reported in the NAPO protocols, uh, it was included because some validation data was uh, pro were provided. But, uh, but uh, I, in, the, in the last test uh, performance study that we um, performed, the QPCR of Arbor and Francis uh, resulted, uh, showed the best uh, performance value at the moment. Uh, now there are some contributions from the chat. Uh, if you scroll down, you, last the f you find the, the last one. This is by Yamandine Cantitu. In France, we found some performance of Harper and Ho Yang. Yeah, it's just a comment on the discussion that's going on on the chat because people are giving their their yes, own results yes. on the performance. So they say, in our condition, Harper performs better than Lee, than Wu Yang, and then Francis. And so Amantine yeah. is just commenting that in their conditions, Harper and Wu Yang have equivalent performance. So this is also what happens when you you have performance characteristics that are established in a, in a laboratory and you also have to run it in your own lab and compare what you get to what are the performance established with the test performance studies. And so uh, there may be slight differences in the way it's implemented. So yeah, I'm 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 looking at okay. the chat Thank continuing and, and Blanca Blanca adding about the conditions. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, that's that's quite an interesting. Yeah. I need to answer to some questions that uh, are loaded in the chat. Yes, we yeah. yes, of course, of course. Um, Esther Marconales asked uh, why this difference in the pooling uh, of uh, the insect, the insect between uh, the experience of Italian researcher and France researcher. I think that the, the new extraction procedure is different. In France, they use the quick pick of Bionobile. In Italy, we use the CTAB uh, extraction, which uh, gen generally um, precipitate more inhibitors. So we prefer to uh, uh, 
tip abstraction is um, is better to pull only five uh, heads because uh, too many uh, inhibitors could be precipitated if we uh, increase the number of heads. Um, um, Maria Vlami, the uh, choice of young, this is a comment to the QPCR of Uyang. Mm -hmm. um, however, labs are free to use Lee and uh, Uyang. Okay. And um, the selection uh, and the, the, the data were uh, validating on six risk plant speeches defined by the U. Maybe the load of bacteria and insects to assure in Italy is much higher. Uh, yes, Blanca, also the concern, yes, could be, uh, could be. Um, also, um, we, um, uh, but uh, we generally doesn't increase, um, we can, uh, we can use, we, we uh, could be used uh, the, in a high number of insects, but the problem is the structure. We prefer to use the CTAB, uh, but uh, um, to test only five heads, no 15 uh, heads. Yes, in Italy it's yeah, much but higher, but not, but yeah. not so uh, so higher because uh, because uh, our CQ value uh, for insects are higher than for plants. Um, Th there is a question from uh, Ma Mario Herrero Tervera about that the fact that the difference in cu is curious versus five versus uh, it's not even 10, it's 15. Uh, why is it? In fact, here we are reporting experiments that have been conducted in France and sometimes we're struggling to make um, a, a, definitive, uh, a definitive recommendation. So you are in a typical case where so far the pooling was recommended to be five. Uh, that was the recommendation. And then when we sent the document for country consultation, we got comments back to say that uh, this in France, we have experience. So in, in a case like that, the underlying, um, um, the underlying point is that five is what is recommended. Um, uh, the, the, the 15 is what has been obtained in experiment in France. Well, uh, Amandine, you say it's 10, but we, we wrote 15 uh, based on information we received. So if we have to change it, we can change it. No problem. And there was a question on when we will uh, reopen the revision of this protocol and, uh, and Julia. Anna, in, her, in one of her last slides, gave examples of points to consider. So at the last meeting in Corsica, so there were new tests uh, uh, that were um, presented and that are worth including in, including in the diagnostic protocol. So we have a meeting um, in, in May in, um, of the panel on diagnostic uh, um and uh and then we will launch uh definitely the new revision of the diagnostic protocol which is um which is an ongoing uh, an ongoing process and in particular uh we have the um, the, the a new tetraplex real time pcr for the detection and identification of subspecies that uh, we want to consider and other and other tests um, and I'm, I'm quoting this one because there was a, a specific presentation made um, so yeah there is another question of Altana I don't read very well uh, Altana Ares uh, Yebra uh, what meal do you recommend to extract quality DNA from eucalyptus and quercus? This matrix is similar to lavanders. To lavander, uh, yes, they are difficult. They are difficult uh, matrices. Um, I, uh, in my experience, I uh, don't recommend the CTAB extraction in this case. <laughs> or uh, you can improve the um, the extraction adding uh, some antioxidant or uh, diluting uh, the samples to um, uh, decrease the effects of inhibitors. 
um, in, um, in France for vectors, the detection identification of suspicion max is 10 vectors. Okay, uh, uh, in APU is reported the uh, experience of uh, um, in France uh, of 15 uh, hits, but uh, probably is uh, uh, the, 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 the data need to be updated every six months. <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because yeah, that that's that's not what we got. So um, we just have to to uh, as you say, this is an, a continuous continuous. That's what uh, quality people call continuous improvement. Um, in the in another question, a... um, Francesca Canuto, um, using the Maricon food kit, I find that the matrix such as rose and ox show an inhibition qPCR reaction. Endogenous gene included as a control not detectable. Using the CTAB to restrict DNA, the problem was solved. Endogenous gene detectable. Do you have uh, do you have any suggestion to improve the extraction by Maricon food kit? Um, the American food kit, uh, um, you can prove only adding some antioxidant in the starting, uh, um, in the starting, uh, the initial step of uh, this, the homogenization, the buffer of destruction. However, the amount of DNA probably is uh, the, um, the amount of DNA because uh, CTAB extracts a higher amount of DNA than uh, in comparison with the American kit. So the problem that the endogenous gene was not uh, detected, it uh, probably based on the concentration of the DNA of this gene. I, I, I don't I don't I didn't uh, test this. Um, um, when dealing with the lavender, uh, we have got the contrast results when dealing with the lavender plants. Uh, so in the the same the same uh, endo control gene we use in the lavender plants. Uh, I ask to Francesca Canuto. So we are we are oh, one hour and a half. So we have we can take the last question if you want, Francois Giuliana. What you say and the beastie. And BC is with BC. us. BC is confined at home uh, with me. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank, thank you for your reply. Is saying, is typing uh, Francesca Canuto. Someone is typing now in the chat, uh, but uh, <laughs> poor <laughs> BC, no more trips for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. I want to really thank you, all the attendees, all the resistance, all the attendees that uh, uh, people that attended our webinar this morning. Thank you for your strong, very strong participation, for your interesting uh, contribution, in, uh, interaction, and side. And of course, thank you very much to Francois Pete and Giuliana Loconsole for being here, for being so uh, uh, available, for, for their contributions, for their answers, for their times. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, joining. Um, and uh, just one thing, stay safe. <laughs> stay home yeah. as long as required and uh, help each other, think about our elder people, and uh, come back safe and um, I'm just so much looking forward to meet you all in person and hug you. It might take some time before we can do that but just seeing you again would be such a relief. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Francois. Hi. Thank you Francois for your words. Thank you, Juliana, and thank you very much. We'll see you next webinar. Thanks again. Stay safe. Stay human. Bye. 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 Bye.